Uh, I'm Dr. Karakas. Uh, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Takas. So, Dr. Daniel Takas is an assistant professor with the neurology department and section of neurophysiology and epilepsy at Baylor College of Medicine, Texas Children's Hospital. So, she's a graduate of the University of Texas Medical Branch School of Medicine and went on to do her clinical, uh, clinical uh, child neurology training at uh, Baylor where she served as chief resident and subsequently completed the clinical neurophysiology fellowship. So we are co-fellow together. Her areas of clinical focus and research include neonatal seizures, epileptic encephalopathies, childhood epilepsies, and particularly epileptic spasms. She is the co-director of epileptic spasms program at Texas Children's. She's a member of Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society and the Gold Humanism Honor Society and numerous additional professional organizations. So she has been honored with teaching awards and holds active membership in multiple professional societies, including the AAP, AAN, ACNS, AES, CNS, and others. So today she will speak about the diagnosis and management of epileptic spasms. So I would appreciate if you can uh, leave your question to the end uh, for the clarity of presentation. So thank you so much and please welcome Dr. Takas. So Daniel, go ahead, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Karakas. It's nice to be with you guys here this morning via the internet. Um, and I appreciate the invitation to come and talk about what is kind of my passion project within child neurology and epilepsy, which is epileptic spasms. Um, I've put the CME code here, um, some places in the beginning, in the middle, and the end of the presentation for those of you who need to sign in in order to obtain CME credit. As Dr. Krakas mentioned, I'm one of the faculty over at Texas Children's in Houston, Texas, and um, we miss Dr. Krakas, but we hope that you guys are enjoying him over at Louisville. So as far as disclosures, I have no financial relationships with commercial interests, but I have, and I always like to appreciate the Texas Neurologic Society for this, been given a small grant um, through this nonprofit organization. To review the learning objectives, I want you guys to be able to um, be exposed to the clinical presentation, diagnostic workup, and management of spasms. And I'll use epileptic spasms and infantile spasms somewhat interchangeably. The most part of these spasms do occur in the infant period, but there, of course, are instances which they occur greater than the infantile period. We'll review the evidence-based guidelines for standardized treatment and we'll discuss the rationale for the development of a comprehensive spasms program at Texas Children's, a tertiary care center. By the end of the presentation, I'm hoping that you guys will be able to better recognize movements and clinical symptoms concerning for spasms, identify aspects for diagnosis and etiological investigations, apply evidence-based guidelines, or at least the literature that we have so far, for standardized treatments of spasms, and to recognize the developmental consequences of untreated spasms the general prognosis of patients with spasms and their outcomes. So as a basic introduction, we can't ever talk about epileptic spasms or infantile spasms without bringing up West syndrome, right? It was described by West in 1841, and it's a triad that consists of, one, epileptic spasms, two, hypsarrhythmia, which is a pattern I will discuss, and three, psychomotor delay or developmental delays or rest in developmental progress. So some people may be wondering, why focus on epileptic spasms? It sounds somewhat innocuous, right? It doesn't sound too concerning. But actually, this is kind of the most common cause of infantile epilepsy, especially infantile epileptic encephalopathies um, in the world. Um, it's a somewhat common um, condition for an overall rare condition, affecting two to three per 10,000 children with a peak, peak incidence that occurs around four to seven months of age, obviously a very important time developmentally for children. There are very frequent delays in diagnosis. The spasms are often mistaken for normal baby movements, which leads to delay in treatments. For example, just this past week, I had a, a pediatrician that I was speaking with about one of our patients. She's been in the practice for over 40 years, and she literally said to me, I didn't know we had treatments for these now. So. For me, education is a huge part of what I hope to achieve through the Epileptic Spasms Program and through kind of the, the general public service announcements that I'm hoping to help to further, at least in my area, and ideally, you know, work with national organizations. There's often been, um, in the history of spasms treatment, a lack of standardized and evidence-based treatment practices and protocols. 
the use of traditional anti-seizure medicines has time and time been showed to have um, not good outcomes or not good uh, efficacy at controlling spasms in the abnormal background pattern of hips arrhythmia. Um, yet they continue to be used pretty frequently, sometimes because of just familiarity with those medications as opposed to the medications I'll talk about in this um, presentation that are better suited for treating spasms. Certainly developmental delays are seen in children who have untreated or delay in treatment of spasms, which are potentially avoidable. Education is key, and very importantly, support staff is key in order to um, successfully achieve timely medication initiation. So what do I do? I start this epileptic spasms program, as I've alluded to, to streamline the treatment, especially at our large institution, and to add to the clinical data. So the goals of our epileptic spasms program was to establish a comprehensive program, and one that can provide clear, um, goals for therapy, as well as evaluation of these patients. The formal program was just started this past July. So of course, in the midst of a COVID pandemic, that was interesting. Um, and the main physicians are myself and Dr. Akshat Katyan, and our nurse coordinator and administrative support contact is Carrie Vanderslice, without whom I don't think we would be able to have very much success in kind of holding everything together. Um, the goals of the program, were to establish standardized evaluation and treatment protocols across our hospital system, to provide regular trainee and honestly departmental education about the best practices, and the development of a patient registry and for which we have an IRB in place in order to um, look at patient groups, treatment outcomes, um, and also to provide educational seminars and participation in national and international data sets. And finally, to evaluate and manage refractory cases, both from within our epilepsy center and from other institutions that need to um, have a second opinion as far as management. So as far as the educational aspects so far of the program, we've uh, developed these protocols, as I've mentioned, which we'll go through. We also have held specific educational seminars, a spasms educational series, including four separate lectures on the basics and treatment of spasms, EEG characterization, focusing more on the neurophysiologic aspects of spasms, diagnostic workup of spasms etiology, which is important, especially when it comes to treatment and management, as well as prognosis. And then we additionally had a specific session focused on the logistics within our specific institution of ordering and scheduling epilepsy monitoring unit studies, as well as the specialty medications, because each of these medications um, particularly ACTH and Vigabatrin, both require specialty enrollment forms, communication with their specific medication hubs. And thanks to our excellent coordinator, we also have monthly refresher sessions. Given that we are a training institution, a teaching institution, and we have general pediatric residents who rotate through our service, our primary neurology service, every month. And so therefore, to kind of Further the education of each person that comes onto the neurology service, we have a refresher kind of going over the basics of this treatment um, each month. I'll talk a little bit about the future directions of the program, um, which I have not been able to do yet, thanks to kind of the hindrance of um, the pandemic. For example, I was hoping to develop some educational seminars for general pediatric practitioners. I plan to have a grand rounds within the Texas Children's Institution this year um, in order to discuss the importance of early recognition and urgent referral for spasms, as well as kind of like I've mentioned before, public health awareness activities, as well as support activities for the families who have um, patients with diagnosis of infantile spasms or epileptic spasms, as well as continued provider and trainee education and refresher courses, and we are considering in the future um, kind of having a formal inpatient consultation team that actively rounds on these patients in collaboration with our ketogenic diet program, which does have formal rounds on our in admitted patients. Especially since ketogenic diet is often used as a treatment in refractory spasms cases. Additionally, we welcome any external referrals or telemedicine conference conferences or consultations within the constructs of insurance approval for cross-state line um, telemedicine uh, consultations, especially for refractory cases. 
So let's kind of start talking about the clinical features of epileptic spasms. And I'm going to pull open a video. Um, let's see if I can play this straight from this PowerPoint. We've had a couple of glitches, but let's see. This is from the Tuber Sclerosis um, Alliance. And uh, so it's going to play via YouTube. Let's see if it works. I think it should. You may not be able to hear the video, I mean, the video sound, but um, it's just an instrumental track. So this is kind of a good educational video that I often um, direct pediatricians to, I often direct families to, for good, good examples of what infantile spasms look like. And there's tons of videos online that um, have good examples of infantile spasms. So as you see here, uh, most of these spasm examples are more symmetric examples, but spasms can be asymmetric in nature. One side can be more affected or, than the other side. But most importantly, they're typically stereotyped. They can be flexor, extensor, or mixed axial jerks, or as this video is showing now, repeated head nods can be more subtle. Some patients just have repetitive eye rolls. Um, and so as you could imagine, sometimes they're easily missed. But see, that's a good example in this video of kind of a striking pattern that's very repetitive, often misdiagnosed as colic, reflex, or other normal baby movements. So this video just kind of tries to um, bring awareness to the importance of spasm evaluation. So you have stop infantile spasms. Number one, see the signs, clusters of sudden repetitive movements that we've mentioned. Take a video, because that's the best way to kind of have a specialist evaluate. Obtain a diagnosis with EEG. And then finally, to prioritize treatment in order to minimize developmental delays if possible. And as this video says, every day delay, you increase your child's risk of brain damage. And there's a great resource here at infantilespasms.org, which I highly recommend anyone to visit if you need to give patients or families information. So infantile spasms are most commonly occurring um, in general upon arousal from sleep, though you certainly can have them kind of within sleep periods, maybe slight, um, you know, stimulation out of sleep, as well as throughout the day, especially as they've, as they've progressed. They typically occur in clusters, especially, again, as the spasms progress um, without treatment especially. And there's typically two compon components. You have the phasic component lasting one to two seconds, and you have the tonic component whenever the baby has stiffening of the, the axial um, sort of torso as well as arms, usually more involved than legs, but you can have both the, the arms and legs involved. Okay, and so looking at the ILAE, the International League Against Epilepsy, which makes me feel like a superhero whenever we talk about that, um, the 2017 classification of seizure types, as you can see, epileptic spasms is not limited to focal or generalized. It can be either uh, onset and can be unknown onset. So I've just put stars demonstrating that here. And um, here in the sub superscript, you can see that degree of awareness in infantile spasms is typically not really specified, mostly because they're so short, um, and so the patient doesn't really have altered awareness after each individual spasm, but certainly can be fussy or cry. So the diagnostic workup for spasms, as I've already alluded to, is definitely getting that um, EEG study. So hips arrhythmia is kind of what you hear of as a classic um, background pattern, so interictal, meaning not during the seizure, but in between spasms, seizures, first described by Gibbs and Gibbs in 1952. And this is a quote from uh, their paper out of the Atlas, or not paper, their Atlas of Electroencephalography back in 1952. Random high voltage waves and spikes, they um, appear to vary from moment to moment, and they originate from multiple areas, so multifocal. And occasionally they may seem generalized, but typically you don't usually get a nice rhythmic, repetitive, or highly organized pattern. That would be more uh, in line with like Linux Gusto with your slow spike in wave patterns. And so the hips arrhythmia definition only requires three main tenets, right? High voltage, and typically that's considered greater than 200 microvolts whenever you measure on the EEG. Disorganized, meaning you don't have the usual um, 
during the periods of hips where they don't have the usual anterior to posterior gradient, um, posterior dominant rhythm, um, and nice kind of like your normal EEG background look. And again, multifocal spikes. So um, spikes coming from multiple different regions is usually a requirement of diagnosis. That being said, you do have um, some other features of hips arrhythmia that I want to mention, and I'll go forward with the modifications of hip, modified hips arrhythmia in the next slide. Most commonly, hips arrhythmia can be seen in non-REM sleep. It's greatly reduced or maybe absent completely in REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. And so typically in your EEG evaluation and diagnosis, if it's not frank hips arrhythmia, and if you have not captured the spasms of concern, you really should capture several sleep cycles to best rule out periods of hips arrhythmia. Why? Because even if only part of an EEG especially during sleep, demonstrates hips arrhythmia. This meets criteria for a hips arrhythmic EEG, okay? And often you may see this only part of an EEG meeting criteria early in the diagnosis of infantile spasms or West syndrome. And so it's important to fully evaluate these patients when, when possible based on institutional limitations. So this is an example, it's kind of a cartoon example of um, a hips rhythmic EEG, and you can just see that there's not really a nice kind of organized pattern. You see very spiky activity in multiple regions, um, and so uh, this is kind of an example of what you'll see. Often, a lot of times, whenever you first open the EEG of a hips rhythmic EEG, it literally looks like a child took a black pen and scribbled all over the page. That's how disorganized it looks. This is an example of kind of um, the gain or the amplitude of the EEG kind of turned down so you can kind of see the full line. But there are five variants of hips arrhythmia. This is not new. This was um, first published in 1984 um, by Drs. Rockaby, Frost, and Kellaway, who we were lucky to have at uh, Baylor. And so the five variants um, here specified are hips arrhythmia with periods of increased interhemispheric synchronization. So that's kind of like the generalized sort of appearance that can come and go, which is the most common variant, but still it meets the criteria of very high amplitude, uh, multifocal spikes and um, disorganization at times. Two, it's asymmetrical hips arrhythmia, so can involve one side more than the other. Hips arrhythmia with a consistent focus of abnormal discharge. So within the multifocal spikes, there can be one specific area that is most prominent. Um, hips arrhythmia with episodes of attenuation. And I, I believe this typically means you have the areas of attenuation, but it's not necessarily associated with the clear clinical spasm. We'll talk about what spasms look like on EEG shortly. And finally, hips arrhythmia comprising primarily high voltage slow activity with a paucity of sharp or spike wave activity. This being said, it should be important to know that modified hips arrhythmia, so any of these five variants, does not have a better prognosis than your classical hips arrhythmia. So it's still considered to have the same sort of concern for developmental um, arrests or developmental delays in the future, if untreated especially. So as far as ictal EEG features, so looking at during a spasm, there's typically three main components. So you have a high amplitude slow wave, medium to high amplitude slow wave, followed by diffuse flattening of the EEG or electro decrement. You'll often see it um, described in the EEG reports with often overriding low amplitude fast activity. But there are 11 combinations possible, which I won't go through, but this is, um, if you'd like the, the resource, it's in this 1979 article, again, by Drs. Kellaway, Rockaby, and Frost, and also Zion. So this is a little bit blurry, and I apologize, but this is kind of comparing um, the normal wake EEG, very organized looking background, to your infantile spasms. And you can see here, you have the hips arrhythmia kind of proceeding on the left side of that infantile spasms example. And you kind of see an abrupt change, right? You see a, a large amplitude, moderate, moderate to high amplitude slow wave, followed by a, like a tampering down, tampening of the activity with that fast activity, kind of looks like a buzz overriding. And this period here is whenever the spasm clinically would occur. So the next important thing to look at, you've diagnosed spasms based on EEG, and the next important thing to look at is what has caused the spasms. And we typically put these patients in two main camps based on what our evaluations show. So symptomatic 
spasms or those with some sort of identified underlying etiology account for 60 to 70 percent of the cases um, based on the different papers that are available compared to cryptogenic or unknown cause spasms which usually account from anywhere from 10 to 40 percent so you see there's a wide range there's certainly um, we have more and more underlying causes, metabolic, genetic, structural causes that we identify over time. And so that's why you kind of see a, a wide range of um, cryptogenic, for example. And so I'll just give you a, a brief example. So here you can see that there's tons and tons of um, potential underlying causes of spasms. And I won't go into these in particular. That would take probably weeks to kind of go through. But Here's a, a great article, Infantile Spasms U.S. Consensus Report, if you have um, further interest um, in looking into, you know, the, the overall report that was from 2010. So um, this brings me to an example protocol. It happens to be my protocol for the diagnostic, diagnosis and workup of epileptic spasms. And as we've discussed, the most important initial step is to confirm the diagnosis with video EEG. As you see here, I've mentioned it often requires an overnight video EEG or at least a prolonged EEG when capable or when possible within institutions. And then we typically also perform a pyridoxine challenge, as is recommended for most um, new onset seizures in patients under the age of two, for example, in order to identify pyridoxine dependent seizures, pyridoxine responsive epilepsy, with the caveat that you may not see response immediately on EEG, sometimes you do, but um, that is more the exception rather than the rule. And so often we will initiate um, pyridoxine treatment while we wait for the confirmatory studies to come back, which I'm gonna discuss shortly. And so once you've done those two things, the next step is typically to get brain imaging, right? Because one of the most common causes of epileptic spasms is tuberous sclerosis. And um, certainly the MRI will come back showing tubers or not tubers or other cortical malformations and other signs of, for example, hypoxic ischemic injury that can give um, a pretty straightforward etiology for the spasms onset. And then the next sort of step or really concurrent step with the further evaluation after you've confirmed a diagnosis of spasms or hypsarrhythmia, is to get your laboratory work. And this includes tons of different things, but um, I would like to at least, at minimum, make sure that the patients have your basic metabolic studies. So you wanna rule out um, problems associated with, you know, your organic acidemia, your um, non-ketotic hyperglycinemia, um, so, and things you need to definitely get a lactate, ammonia, your basic blood count, um, comprehensive metabolic panel, you know, your basic studies that you do for many patients who present with seizures, whether infantile or, or older. And there is, I tried to get this on each patient, a free epilepsy gene panel. It's sponsored by certain um, um, commercial interests, but I'm not gonna mention the exact um, sort of website that you use. Speak to your friendly epileptologist or many of the general neurologists also will of course, know about this panel, but this is free for patients less than eight years of age. And then finally, um, there are certain uh, lab groups that will do a neonatal seizure panel testing for treatable conditions. And this usually includes both blood, CSF, and urine testing. For example, looking at your amino acids, your urine organic acids, acyl carnitine profile, as well as the vitamin B6, the pyridoxine dependent epilepsy labs, the AASA and pipicolic acid are examples of those, as well as, and I misspelled guanido acetate, my apologies, your creatine guanido acetate, your biotinidase, and your urine purines and pyrimidines. So these are all um, causes that are thought to be easily treatable if they're diagnosed early and um, managed appropriately. And again, there are certain labs that have such panels, but I'm not gonna mention specific ones today during this presentation. So of course, 2020 was a year of obstacles and 2021 has had its fair share so far. You know, we in Texas have had this kind of crazy winter storm in the last two weeks, which, you know, prevented a lot of my patients who were supposed to get their follow-up EEG, um, from coming in or has present, prevented literally the start dates for some of the medications because literally the trucks were not able to go out and do deliveries because we don't know how to drive on ice here in Texas. But in early um, 2020, 
um, early in the pandemic, the Child Neurology Society did put out some um, kind of modifications to the recommendations for infantile spasm management um, and evaluation. So uh, certainly in the beginning when we weren't sure about kind of how the pandemic was going to be shaping up, they recommended to minimize in-person healthcare visits, which we took to heart. We mostly did all of our visits for spasms patients via telemedicine. Um, and it was very key to get a home video that captures the spasms. And after review, kind of we would look at whether we felt like treatment was warranted based on kind of the clinical presentation, which is not you know, our typical way of doing things, but EEG confirmation is, again, was strongly encouraged um, to obtain at least one sleep cycle. And at that time, outpatient EEG was preferred over inpatient admission. And follow-up EEG, so the CNS recommended that if parents reported that clinical spasms were continuing, that you should add or modify treatment without a confirmatory EEG, again, this is during pandemic times, whereas if the clinical spasms were reported to be resolved or if the caregiver was uncertain, a repeat EEG was advised, um, including at least one sleep cycle. And during the pandemic height, again, outpatient EEG was felt to be more safe um, for patient and for techs, for example, over inpatient admission. These make sense in the context of the pandemic, but I'm gonna show you quickly some data that I've collected over the past year. Um, and I've actually had more patients to add to this um, cohort since this was um, presented at the American Epilepsy Society meeting, virtually of course, in December. And essentially, um, certainly in the past, going back to the times of Rockaby and uh, Frost and, and Kellaway, there have been, um, under-reporting of spasms, especially whenever it comes to follow-up studies by parents whenever they're on treatment. They see a significant reduction in the spasms. They think, my, my child is not having spasms anymore. And time and time again, we've proved that actually they are, they're just more subtle and so you're not recognizing them. So there's been significant data put out on that uh, as far as like parents under recognizing spasms. However, I'll bring your attention to this chart within my uh, poster that's soon hopefully going to be um, published as a manuscript um, with the additional patients. Um, you can see that these highlighted um, no examples are examples of when parents had actually said my patient, my, my child is still having spasms despite the two-week therapy with appropriately chosen medications. And, and at least three patients out of, um, sorry, three patients out of, I believe, 15, sorry, out of 28, that patients reported, patients supposedly had continuation of spasms. We were able to capture those events of concern on EEG with an overnight EEG and demonstrate that they actually were not spasms. So this kind of has led to our development of essentially the recommendation to do at least an extended EEG at that two week follow up mark so that we don't further um, increase treatment as the CNS, if I go back, has uh, recommended here. If spasms continue, you're gonna add or modify treatment, right? Well, what if those events are actually those normal baby movements that are sometimes difficult to, um, com are often confused with spasms. So this highlights the importance of the objective continuous EEG or extended EEG at the two week mark, specifically for our institution. And we are lucky, and I will admit that um, I feel very fortunate to be at an institution where we have um, significant el electrographic monitoring um, resources. And I certainly understand that not all institutions are privy to those uh, resources. So for our institution at Texas Children's, from April to July, we utilize mostly the outpatient EEGs, two to three hour EEGs, to reduce the 24 hour admissions, both for diagnosis and for follow up many, in many instances. And this was especially true while we were on kind of hospital shutdown mode or reducing any elective procedures, surgeries, admissions. However, over the course of the summer, we transitioned back to reopening our EMU, um, both for our characterization studies, our surgical plan planning studies, and our spasms diagnosis and follow-up patients. So um, all the EMU admits get a COVID-19 test 
um, two to three days prior to admission. And so it's been our practice this year that any fever, illness symptoms, or positive results revert, result in deferring that um, hospital admission. And so we, we then do fall back on treating based on parental report because we don't want to increase our exposure for our techs, um, for our medical staff, and um, for our other patients at the hospital to a COVID positive individual. So the last treatment guideline that was um, put out by the American Academy of Neurology was last done in 2012. And as you can see here, really the only sort of level B at maximum evidence at that time was considered to be TCH. And at that time, they actually said low dose TCH can be considered as an alternative to high dose TCH for treatment of spasms, ACTH for treatment of spasms. I believe that was mostly due to safety profile and uh, side effect profile. Um, but there have been a lot of papers put out since this time. Um, we just haven't seen the actual finalized new recommendations come out. So I'm going to kind of go through some of that um, evidence and papers now. Not um, exhaustive, but hopefully we can kind of agree that there need to be some changes to this um, guideline. So the first kind of major study that was put out that I'm going to talk about was the UKIS study, the United Kingdom Infantile Spasm Study that was put out in Lancet in 2004, the first kind of mutterings about this. And so this study compared using Vigabatrin with a hormonal-based therapy, that is either oral prednisolone or the um, intramuscular ACTH or tetracos tetracosactide, which is the European version of ACTH. It's important to note here that the prednisolone dose used was not a um, weight-based dose. It was a 10 milligram four times a day start and then a taper thereafter for you do the 10 milligrams four times a day times two weeks. And so in general, kind of the two comparison arms, um, you had 55 patients in the hormonal group compared to 52 patients in the vigabatrin group. Again, not super big numbers, so we have to take everything with a grain of salt. But um, we saw 73% overall reduction in the hormonal treatment group compared to just a 54%, um, sorry, spasm freedom or hypsarrhythmia freedom at the 14-day mark of therapy in the vigabatrin group. And you can see the breakdown between ACTH and prednisolone there, but the study was not powered to compare between those two hormonal groups. And unfortunately, you'll see that's a recurring theme. Um, and looking at the developmental outcomes, so they use something called the Vinland Adaptive Behavioral Scales. I'll refer to it as VAVs. Um, and so, again, this is the same UKIS study. Um, the main developmental score, this behavioral scale, did not significantly differ between the two groups at 14 months. However, infants with cryptogenic spasms, so those that we don't have a clear underlying cause for the spasms, their mean VAV scores were higher in the hormonal arm of therapy compared to the vigabatrin arm. Then here is an example of that same UKIS trial that looked at developmental and epilepsy outcomes at four years. Again, using the VABS four, and then the epilepsy severity was actually used, um, was actually evaluated via questionnaire. Um, and they did not find major significant difference in general between, again, the hormonal and vigabatrin groups, but the cryptogenic spasms, once again, the VAB scores were higher in the hormonal treatment group compared to vigabatrin. So the summarized findings essentially are this. Early seizure control is important, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, towards the end of the presentation. But um, development at 14 months was better in the cryptogenic group and at four years in the cryptogenic group if steroids were used over vigabatrin. This is a, a more recent study in the Annals of Neurology in 2016 um, by Dr. Nupp et al, um, showing that a little bit different sort of um, outcomes, showing that there was maybe a trend in favor of ACTH. Granted, this is high dose ACTH that's used, um, so 150 uh, units per meter square total per day divided twice daily. And again, kind of using just that non-weight-based dose of the prednisolone, the 10 milligram four times a day. And as I meant, as I wrote in a couple of slides ago, that is eight milligram per kilogram per day if the patient is five kilos. But many of these patients are not just a five kilo baby. This can present up to age, two years of age often. And so you'll definitely be on a lower mig per kig, milligram per kilogram dosage 
per day if you just go with the standard set milligram treatment per day. So this is not really evaluating a weight-based high-dose prednisolone. And so again, you can see that the hormonal therapies in general are um, considered to be more effective at, at eliminating spasms and hypsarrhythmias that, at that 14-day mark compared to um, uh, vigabatrin, though here you kind of see a trend more in favor of ACTH, certainly. Again, this one had um, a better enrollment, so we had 230 patients as opposed to like half of that in the UK study. And this is one of the few studies that we have kind of looking at um, actual high-dose prednisolone. Again, not a weight-based um, uh, dose, but up to 60 milligrams per day versus moderate dose. Um, this was SACTH, um, but essentially this is giving ACTH on um, alternating days. So a little bit different protocol, but this one showed prednisolone with far better res resolution of spasms and hypsarrhythmia compared to ACCH. So all in all, what I wanna drive home is that there hasn't really been a good randomized controlled prospective trial comparing high dose ACTH to high dose prednisolone. There was a 2016 study by Nup et al. in the Annals of Neurology looking at um, the 40 to 60 milligrams of prednisone compared to the 150 unit per meter squared of ACTH. And they found that actually, and I didn't include it in the slide set, but they found that there was a statistically insignificant difference between the outcomes of spasms between ACTH and that high-dose prednisolone. Um, but I think we really need um, a, a large multi-center trial to look at the high-dose prednisolone because especially, as you see here, the cost comparison is dark. You're at two major ends of the spectrum, right? Prednisolone is quickly available, um, very inexpensive, whereas ACTH, there's so many medication delays if it weren't for our, our nurse coordinator, Carrie, who've had, who's had to at times have at least 10 phone conversations per day with the, the medication hub, especially for ACTH, um, communicating back and forth with him for up to five days at a time. And that includes like where the medication is going to be delivered, which pharmacy it's going to be filled through. Um, and I will also say that I have seen increased side effects in ACTH compared to prednisolone as well whenever patients are on that therapy. But overall, kind of the, the take home part, part, point from the evidence I want you to take away is that hormonal therapy seems to be superior to vigabatrin, with one exception, whenever you have a diagnosis of tuberous sclerosis, which that's well documented in the literature, but that's the first line therapy for patients with tuberous sclerosis. And actually, there is currently an actively recruiting, recruiting trial for patients with diagnosed tuberous sclerosis that um, uses vigabatrin before seizures or spasms even present. So it's a preventative uh, trial that's ongoing right now. And you can look at, if you're interested in that, that um, you can go to infantilespasms.org um, and look at the research tab. So there has been a, the most recent sort of um, consortium is the ICIS with a C this time. So it's the International Collaborative Infantile Spasm Study, which has started putting out some literature starting in 2017. That started looking at what about dual therapy for the first line. So this is comparing hormonal therapy, either the ACTH um, or the prednisolone, compared to a dual therapy with both one of those hormonals plus vigabatrin. And as you can see here, like it seems that the dual therapy has um, improvement in the spasm freedom and hypsarrhythmia freedom from 14 to all the way to 42 days. So certainly over that two week sort of mark compared to the hormonal treatment only. Um, that being said, there are barriers to using dual therapy because of costs, insurance approval, side effect profiles, certainly we'll talk about that. Um, and also of note, in follow-up studies, there was no significant developmental or epilepsy outcome differences between the dual therapy group or the hormonal therapy only group at 18 months. Of course, studies are still ongoing to kind of look into this, but that's just um, one thing that I wanted to mention, this new ICIS randomized multicenter open label trial. So here's our treatment protocol at Texas Children's whenever it comes to the initial therapy. So we have not yet adopted dual therapy from the 
on set, mostly because we're taking baby steps. And so as you see here, you have two main arms, right? You have the tuber sclerosis known diagnosis, which you would start by gabapentin, and then you have the non-tuber sclerosis side. Um, and you would start some sort of hormonal therapy, a steroid, ACTH, or prednisolone. And we use the standard 150 international units per meter squared per day over two weeks, divided BID, or the prednisolone, eight milligram per kilogram per day. So we do a weight-based dosing divided three times a day or four times a day for two weeks, max 60 milligrams per day. And with that, with either one of these two treatment arms, you're going to want to do a follow-up EEG at the two-week mark. Now. Again, we've talked about ACTH. You've got the cost consideration. You've got the time to actually initiate the medication because of delays in um, insurance approval, delays in medication delivery, multiple phone conversations back and forth, and um, multiple needs for documentation and paperwork. Whereas prednisolone is easy to prescribe, but there's still kind of the jury is out on whether it's overtly um, equal in its efficacy. But we feel like it's probably at least reasonably comparable efficacy to ACTH. And again, I'll say that I see less side effects with prednisolone in general um, compared to ACTH. And obviously we know vigabrogen for TSC. So both of these arms, like I said, need a repeat study at two weeks of therapy, roundabout. We usually say sometime between 10 day of therapy to day 18, at which point they've already started weaning the, um, the hormonal therapy. The vigabrogen we usually at least treat for three months, if not six months. And you can see that in this protocol here, continuing the vigabrogen for six months. Um, all right. And this is kind of what I've developed since I've started as faculty um, and even within my fellowship. The dual treatment protocol for that two week mark, if they're still having, so sorry, if they're still having um, spasms at the two week mark after appropriately chosen therapy then we will go on to do dual therapy. So no to treatment success if they did not have significantly intolerable side effects on hormonal therapy and the first hormonal therapy was oral prednisolone. We will stop that, switch them to ACTH since there have been some studies showing ACTH with superior efficacy and we'll add the vigabatrin. Whereas if the side effects were not tolerable, we will usually just start the vigabatrin at that time, especially if they're having hypertensive urgency, if they're having um, significant problems as far as hyperglycemia, um, or parents are like at their wits end and they cannot get any sleep or, you know, cannot stand how miserable their child is. You know, parents are not going to give a medication that they feel like is overall harmful to their child, despite some of our, you know, evidence based on the studies we have. So side effects, like I'm talking about, we talked about steroids, they can have irritability, weight gain, hypertension, hyperglycemia. And so I've worked with our renal and endocrine colleagues specifically to kind of set up um, what are our thresholds, you know, that we would, we would require either emergent evaluation in the ER or urgent consultation with renal clinic, um, hypertension clinic, to be able to get medications on board for these patients. In general, endocrine says that, you know, your risk of hypoglycemia in these hypoglycemia in these patients compared to hyperglycemia is much more concerning. So they typically don't recommend starting insulin in general, but certainly we have our colleagues to call in those departments if we need. Um, as far as vigabatrin, you have to talk about the big black box warning, right? So that there is potential irre irreversible peripheral vision loss risk. So we still um, hold the every three month ophthalmology visits as a recommendation. And um, there have been more recent sort of um, monitoring studies that show lower percentages compared to these that I've listed here. Um, certainly there's a higher risk in adults, but certainly there's a higher risk with um, prolonged treatment and with um, very high doses. So only 9% of children treated less than 12 months at maximum in the studies that I've seen so far have developed this side effect. Um, usually we talk about this with the parents and especially in the patients who have significant cortical, you know, vision impairment. Um, this is less of a concern, the, the peripheral vision loss. To my knowledge, there's been no um, reports of any central vision loss. And of course, you can also have MRI related changes um, in response to vigabatrin. 
These are reversible, however, and so you usually get T2 hyperintensities, restricted diffusion in the deep sort of uh, brain uh, regions, brainstem and uh, cerebellar dentate nuclei. But again, these are reversible with reduction or elimination of figabatrin. So in general, I don't keep patients on this medication more than six months unless there's been significant developmental improvement and if the parents are willing to accept that risk kind of with the more longer term treatment up to 12 months um, of that peripheral vision effect, which again is more so in my patients who have severe developmental underlying conditions or cortical visual impairment. So overall, kind of just talking about overall patients with epileptic spasms, Back in the early part of the study, I mentioned that, um, you know, up to 70% of patients with epileptic spasms have some sort of underlying known etiolo etiologic cause, genetic, metabolic, structural. So it kind of makes sense that up to 80% of patients who have had a history of spasms are going to have some form of intellectual disability, right? Cryptogenic patients, on the other hand, that tend to up to maybe 40% of patients, and I think that's very generous, um, have the best potential prognosis and can have a normal developmental outcome. 94% of patients, up to 94% of patients in the literature, um, continue with active epilepsy after even spasms are resolved. And 15% to 20% of patients with history of epileptic spasms go on to progress to Lennox Gastaut syndrome, which is a intractable, um, very difficult to treat, multi-type of seizure um, sort of syndrome. And of course, there's also a high risk of autism, which comes with a lot of the intellectual disability and intellectual, um, sorry, developmental effects that can come from essentially a chaotic brain wave pattern, right? And multiple frequent seizures that we see in some of these patients. There is an important um, trend that was noticed in that United Kingdom infantile spasms uh, group in that when there are delays in treatment, should be a space there, greater than seven days, there is a 3.9 point reduction in that VAB score, that behavioral score, um, associated with each sequential interval delay of therapy as follows. So if the therapy is delayed more than seven days, up to 14 days, a 3.9 point reduction in that development score. If two to four weeks, another 3.9 reduction. Four to eight weeks, yet another 3.9 reduction, greater than eight weeks. So again, this is a 12, no, a 16 point reduction in that score if the therapy is delayed from onset or diagnosis to actual start of medication, appropriately chosen medication, if the patient is delayed just eight weeks. That's why we consider infantile spasms. I call it an urgency. I don't call it always an emergency because I'm like, it's okay if they come to the hospital in two days, but not in two weeks, right? So the takeaway point from this entire presentation that I'm hoping that I have conveyed to you all is infantile spasms, right? We need to treat early. We need to treat appropriately based on the data that we have. And I hope to add to that data in the future. Um, here's several resources that you can use both as um, caretakers in the medical field, as well as to give to your families, infantilespasms.org epilepsy.com, and then clicking on the infantile spasms um, syndrome link. And then finally, healthychildren.org um, has a really, really great um, infantile spasms page for the general public, as well as for pediatricians. So I hope that by the end of this talk, you're now better able to recognize the presentation and clinical symptoms of spasms, identify aspects for diagnosis and etiologic evaluations, and to apply the evidence-based literature that we have so far for standardized treatment of epileptic spasms, aka use those hormonal therapies and less tuberous sclerosis used by gabatrin over traditional seizure medications for the first-line therapy, and to recognize potential developmental consequences of untreated spasms prognosis of patients with spasms, and the variable outcomes. And finally, I hope you can appreciate why I felt the need to develop a dedicated spasms programs within our Texas Children's Institution, where we see at least one diagnosis of new onset infantile spasms per week. Um, and so I believe my numbers are, within the last year now, are kind of upwards of 70 patients. Um, and so I hope to be 
you know, getting some papers out in the upcoming future. And I hope you guys will look for those. And so we can work together to best serve this patient population. And with that, I thank you guys for listening. And I'm happy to take any questions now. Um, hopefully I can give you the best possible answers. Danielle, thank you so much. That was like a fantastic talk, I think. So I have two questions. Sure. So how do you go about like recurrence of infantile spasms? Is the treatment going to be the same? Like are you going to follow the same protocol? And the other question is, is what is the latest of uh, latest age of the hip arrhythmia or spasm that you see? What was the oldest case that you treated? Oh, okay. Good questions. So recurrence of infantile spasms. So it depends on where the patient is in their treatment journey at that time, right? So let's say, let's go with the easiest possible case. And the best case scenario typically is you treat the patient's spasms, they're developmentally still on track, the spasms completely resolve, you're able to wean off of that hormonal therapy, right? So let's say the spasms come back in three months, okay? They start slowly coming back. Typically, I repeat the first treatment that I did since I know it was successful. But in some cases, especially patients that have some un some known underlying etiology, I will kind of do that dual treatment pair, uh, dual treatment protocol in order to give it the one-two punch. You know, there's not like the best, um, we don't even have the best data for the initial treatment of spasms, right? So we're still waiting on kind of outcomes with recurrence of spasms, but that's kind of been my practice. If they're completely normal developing, don't have um, any sort of other delays or known diagnoses, I'll either repeat that initial therapy that seemed to at least give them freedom for the several months, or I'll do the dual therapy, depending on the parent and family comfort, comfort with that dual therapy protocol, um, and depending on, um, you know, whether they had significant side effects with the previous therapies. There's a lot of things that go into it. So, um, and in, on the other hand, if you have a patient, let's say, who has um, significant uh, structural abnormalities of their brain structure, um, and they required like a second line therapy like vigabatrin, so they're still on vigabatrin, I'll add back a steroid treatment onto their, their regimen to try to get control of that. And then your second question about what's kind of the oldest age that I've seen hips arrhythmia in, I'm thinking that's been about the two-year-old mark, um, and my suspicion is in those patients, um, most of the time they convert over to like a Linux Gusto pattern by that time because their brain has just been in this chaotic pattern for so long that they kind of progress, unfortunately, on that syndrome pathway that we see, you know. So they go from like just having spasms to West syndrome, severe developmental sort of outcomes to Linux Gusto oftentimes. Sorry? Would you try steroids on those patients as well? Yes, short term, right? You just do the high dose for two weeks. But mm -hmm. typically, I will recommend that we consider early vigabatrin therapy in those patients as well, because that's going to be more of a longer um, treatment uh, treatment course rather than just the two weeks high dose and starting to wean. And I guess your question is, do you try steroids? Your question is, do you try steroids on the two-year-olds with hip arrhythmia? That's your question? Yes. Yeah, yes. I would still try it. Okay. Thank you. Any other question? So I, I had a quick question. If you, uh, hi, my name is Grant Turk. I'm one of the child neurology residents. And okay. I was wondering, I know we talked about, you know, if the patient has tuberous sclerosis, of course, we're going to go with the gabitrin as our first line. Mm -hmm. What about if they have kind of uh, any other underlying structural abnormalities? Is there anything that pushes you more towards like uh, the high dose steroids versus the ACTH? Or is it... um... Sorry, I'll let you finish. Uh, no, that's the that's the meat of the question. Okay, sure. Um, so whenever it comes to patients with clear like cortical migration abnormalities and cortical malformations, right, other than tuber sclerosis. You already mentioned, we know we do vigabatrin in that case. Um, I will often do the dual therapy at the onset there. Um, and your question to you as far as whether we do ACTH versus vigabatrin, I, I'm sorry, ACTH versus prednisolone, I will typically still try the prednisolone um, but getting them on vigabatrin um, for a kind of a longer treatment 
protocol is my go-to, um, but with the steroid initial treatment as well. And that's honestly mostly because of the side effect profile that I get with ACTH and also because of a lot of the difficulties with um, initiating the ACTH within that one week sort of time frame. Um, I will, I do find that a lot of times these patients with cortical migration abnormalities or significant structural abnormalities who present with spasms have probably had those for more than what we've known them for. You know, like those patients typically have multiple different types of seizures. And so um, kind of doing the, the dual therapy in those selected cases, I do typically try to um, use prednisolone plus the vigabatrin early. Thank you. Yeah. This is Lizzie Dahl. I, I just have a quick question about nomenclature. Um, sure. <clears throat> so um, do you prefer to call it epileptic spasms um, just because infantile spasms implies that the age range is infantile? You're exactly right. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so, so we certainly with like Down syndrome, for example, you can certainly see spasms um, present well outside that kind of quote unquote, infant range. So that's why we, when it came to like naming our program, we said, let's call it epileptic spasms. Same thing with tuber sclerosis, right? You can have spasms that the onset is far outside the infant range. So we prefer using um, epileptic spasms. Certainly you saw with the UKIS data and the ICIS data, they still use the term infantile spasms. They're synonymous. It's just that epileptic spasms is more inclusive. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate you guys um, taking the time to listen today. Um, please feel free to contact me at my email here on this slide. Um, if you have any questions, concerns, want to run a patient by us, I'm happy to help. And uh, I appreciate your attention, everyone. Thanks so much, Danielle, for joining us today. So thanks so much. That's All right, you guys. Thank you. thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed. Thank you, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.